Okay, so the date is December 9th, 2018, and I'm here in Woodbury, New York, with Sheldon Calvar, a local World War II veteran. Um, Sheldon, I want to say uh, thank you for agreeing to do this interview today, um, and I'm sure everyone who is going to watch this video is also going to be very grateful for you agreeing to share your story. So on behalf of everyone, uh, thank you for this today. Um, so I know I introduced you, um, but if you could just go ahead and say your full name and your date of birth. My name is Sheldon. As a matter of fact, my name is Sheldon Douglas Wernick Calva, with a dash between Wernick and Calva. Well, we dropped the Wernick. It was my mother's maiden name, and she was a, a, a woman of some attitude. Uh, uh, because my name is Sheldon, and I was born in Brooklyn, I uh, studied the Joe Lewis boxing technique when I was seven, mostly because I had to. You have to win your first fight, but if you do, you're okay. But I know that you had to win the first one, and I was prepared to take the blows. It was uh, uh, tough, but uh, I was called Sheldon instead of Sheldon, which is a different name. Uh, tap, tap, ring the link, we owe. <laughs> Three steps to Germany. Emmys. Checkers. Yep. If you go ahead and just say your date of birth. Uh, my, I was born on June 13th, 1922, and I'm 96 years old. And who were your parents' names? My, uh, my father was... Gabriel Calva. He was born on March 15th, 1879, as I said before, in a world lit by fire. And at the same time that I have a computer in my pocket. That has fascinated me that in a generation we have lived through three different periods, the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. I mean, no, the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. Yes, we covered those. And uh, the change that took place and how much I have seen. How wonderful it was. Radio was invented in uh, 1920 uh, by Marconi. And uh, we had a... Uh, the front room of the house was called the sunroom, a playroom, for some reason. And my brother got killed because when he made the battery for his radio, he got acid on the parquet floor. A parquet is a form of uh, wood that they have on the floor. My mother was very upset, but uh, I thought it was fantastic. And he said, listen to that. That music is from Philadelphia. And uh, uh, God, music coming over a, a box. That was fantastic. Yes. Uh, of course, I don't imagine <laughs> that would be much of a thrill to kids who are uh, watching 3D television, you know, but uh, it was quite a thrill if you're seven and you hear music from Philadelphia and uh, but my brother got in trouble because he, in making, you had to make your own battery at that time I suppose uh, and he got some acid on the parquet floor the first time I saw a television. It was a six by six screen. That is six inches by six inches. That's very small. And it was the richest girl in the neighborhood. And 13 people would come in to see the six by six. And she was the queen of the neighborhood <laughs> with the uh, 
Yeah. Could you describe your mother? Um, who was your mother? Was yes, your my, my mother came from Morgantown, West Virginia. Not really. My mother was born in Brooklyn and was taken to Morgantown, West Virginia when she was two, when her father, who had lost his business in the 29 crash, Gee, I saw the three houses that he had built. They were beautiful, I imagine. He was selling them for $11,000 each, and they go for about, a, oh, I don't know, even when I saw them 40 or 50 years ago, they were going for $140,000 each. But uh, he couldn't sell them. Your, your wife's, your mother's father? No. My, uh, my wife's, my mother's husband. Oh, your mother's husband. Uh, Florence's father. Mm -hmm. And so, because he had failed, he moved to, uh, <clears throat> they had friends in uh, Pennsylvania that were transferring scrap metal into, into steel. And they her father was told to pick up junk for three months with a horse and wagon and find out how they would steal from him by putting stones with metal and uh, all. So he'd be sophisticated enough. Then they raised the money, $300. And he went to Morgantown, West Virginia, where he opened up I would call it a junk shop, but it, they called it a, a scrap steel spot. And it was a junkyard. I guess he was one of the few men who lived through World War II who didn't make any money when he was in a position <laughs> to do so. Uh, no, I can't say he didn't make any money. He made a living. And, uh, they lived there. He just didn't get... Rich off well, of Well, I, I don't know. None of the men, that, none of the fathers seem to have a business acumen. When he uh, moved into the house, his brother said, well, buy the house, it's $2,800. You're paying $40 a month, and you won't pay anything, and you, you'll own uh, and uh, pay a mortgage. Or, he said, no, I don't so for, for uh, you know, 15 years, he paid the more, he paid the rent. Then he bought the house for $2,500, <laughs> you know. And they, uh, fathers at that time. I was a, I was a little more effective because it seemed quite important, uh, an important thing to, to do well. Could you describe your childhood growing up in the 1920s and the, in the 30s and during the Depression? Well, I did not know. No, I can't say we were, we were never poor. We were only broke. We were never poor because we felt that we had talent. And if you feel that way, it's, it's really different. Then everybody felt that way. We all felt that we were talented people who were broke. And when the situation changes, we'll be there ready to change with it. But, of course, it meant CCNY, not... Uh, and in my own pretentiousness now, I must confess that when people say, what school did you go to? I do say the Sorbonne. That's the School of Letters of the University of Paris. And I did go there, but only for a graduate degree. You know, it's, but uh, what school, you know? And it was very important because after the war, when I came back home ultimately. I joined the French Club of New York 
and who should I meet there but Bill Klein. He had had the same instructors. I mean, not only had he been to the Sorbonne, but he had the same instructors. And they had changed. Oh, gee, when I had the head of the school, I thought he was rather pompous, rather formal guy. And when Bill had him, he was a defrocked priest who wanted to marry, uh, and it was considered, wow, what a, a sexy story. And uh, uh, when I, by the time I went to school, Bill was uh, more than 10 years old than I, and uh, yes, we, but I met him, and he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm a, uh, it was then now. I mean, I didn't know, you know, should you study to be a physician and start school all over? So you, you don't know. And he said, come with me. He said, I own the beverage market guy, a magazine in the liquor field. And uh, you may start, well, I'm, you start at the bottom. I was editor-in-chief in the year. And... Uh, you don't make much money, but it's the best job in New York. To be the editor of a magazine is the best job in New York. It's a shame that they don't give you any cash with it. But uh, you meet a lot of people, you do a lot of, you write your own. And that was before the war or after? No, after this was after. This was after. After, yes. So oh, uh, before the war, no, I'm, I'm 19. I went to my Uncle Mike, you know. This was in, this was before the war? Broke no, this, was, this was the day of the war. Oh. The could, day of the war. Could you describe your childhood growing up in, during the Great Depression? Um, like, what, what, how well, did yeah, you... You had no idea. You had no idea that life was different than this. You didn't think of yourself as broke or poor or anything like that. He said, this is how it is. My father, bless him, bless my father, wonderful, wonderful human being. I mean, very few times can you say of a human being that he was both very wise and very kind. I mean, that's an unusual combination. And the only thing I hold against him is the fact that he set a standard for fatherhood I could never reach. I mean, I grew up never knowing, never knowing anything about things. Well, if you were hungry, they, you got fed. If you needed shoes, you got shoes. Yeah, there was, you didn't, and the, the cardboards and shirts were to be cut out so it would be filled in your shoes to cover the hole in the center there so you wouldn't feel things on, I mean, but that was how things were. You, you didn't know that there was a lack of anything. That's how things were. I'm sorry. You uh, were saying. No, no, that's okay. Um, so you would, would, if shoes got a hole in them, you would put cardboard in yeah. to fill up the hole. Yeah. Wow, that's that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, oh, yeah. You see, it's, it's the idea of how can you get $3.40 so that you could buy shoes at... Uh, Oh, there was a store then that was that sold good shoes for a three forty. Uh, and so, after um, the depression, you know, during throughout the thirties, you know, obviously Adolf Hitler was stirring things up in Germany during that time. Yes, and they were starting to expand their borders as well as the Japanese uh, in the Pacific and their. In China, did you ever hear, like on the news or in the radio or in the newspapers, the stuff that Hitler and the Japanese were getting up to? And did you ever, like in the late 30s? Not up to then the, so much. Then. But uh, 
it's when the war occurred that you you're uh, you're very interested in what was happening but prior to that you just loved the president roosevelt because he, he wanted good things for people who needed them he He was willing to look after the poor as well as us. You know that us and the poor, now that I think of it, had a certain similarity. But at that time, your thoughts were, he looks after the poor and uh, he helps us get jobs. So you were, you were, a, big Ro you were a big Roosevelt fan oh, at the time. Oh, oh. Everyone was. Oh. Oh. Did you ever listen to his fireside chats? On oh, radio? yes. And you felt... You felt that he was interested. It's like I feel about my father's role as a father. You felt he was interested. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had a friend that you sort of didn't know about. Yes. And it was wonderful to have such a man as president. There is no president subsequently that you feel love for, though you felt respect for. Uh, I liked Eisenhower, yeah. except I had qualifications. I said, he can't put a sentence together. He's a good man, but he can't put a sentence together. And I have no idea even what that sentence means. <laughs> he can't put a sentence together. Well, and, uh, uh, oh, I, I, he wasn't good at speeches, but he was a good man. Eisenhower. Eisenhower. So, I'm sorry. So, was it, this was a feeling like you, your friends, your family all loved FDR, you loved President Roosevelt. At the yes, time. but most of most of the time, mm -hmm. subsequently, they vote. We all voted mm -hmm. Democratic because that was. I didn't vote for Eisenhower. I don't think, though I do think of him as a great president. Yeah. So, on progressing forward into the early forties, um, you know, the war in Europe by nineteen forty was you know in full blast of oh. the invasion of Poland and all that. <laughs> Now, the funny thing yeah. is that the day that the What's a Pearl Harbor, we said, my brother and I went to a dance in Manhattan, in Manhattan and we were there watching the news on the New York Times. They had uh, mm -hmm. uh, information going around the building. And he said, we said, what's a Pearl? We thought it was a thing. Mm -hmm. What is a Pearl Harbor? Meaning, well, what's a Pearl Harbor? And uh, that's how we found out. So that was that was a war on. That was the day that Pearl Harbor was attacked. Yes. You and your brother were in the city, and you saw the yeah. news. Yeah, but can you city. City. Remember, I'm I'm 19. My brother's 36, mm -hmm. and we're both at a dance. Yeah. And he took me. Wow. You know. Well, we know he didn't take me. We went together. And how did, when did you find out that it was a um, that Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese? Well, when then, it was a, then a, we a, uh, we you know we talked about it with the people mm -hmm. uh, around, and then uh, it's an attack, and then it probably means war. And what was your reaction, um, or what were you feeling when you you when I said you, to say, we were going to war? I said to say. Should we go home? He said, no, I can't. Okay. My brother was there. The people who came of age in the 1920s, I'm talking about before the 29, it was the time to be happy in America. I mean, Flappers mm -hmm. and yeah, 
It'd be a college boy then. <coughs> <coughs> Instead of having uh, 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 50 million people and 100 million people in the university, then we had 6 million. Mm -hmm. And to get to college was uh, sort of special. It was a big thing. Yeah, and because you had to get out of high school then Yeah. to, to be... Right. Yeah, and in those days, most people after high school went straight to straight to work. Yes, yes. So, um, after did you listen to Roosevelt's declaration of war speech after the day after? Yes. The, well, what, what were you, were you in the living room listening to the radio, or what do you remember when you were listening to FDR declare war on Japan? No, I was inside the house, mm -hmm. and we knew he was going to speak. He had announced it in advance, and we were prepared. I mean, we turned the radio on a half hour before he was on. We were waiting for him to speak. And at that time, we were sort of used to announcements, that sales and things of that sort. Now. I, I really dislike commercials on television, and I've set up my uh, television so I almost don't see them because I tape the things in advance. Mm -hmm. And when the commercials come on, I can fast forward them out. And to me, it's worth seeing it late rather than... Uh, I, all the news does not come to me when it's ripe news, but an hour later or two hours later, because I wanted uh, so that I can see it. My thought processes are interrupted when I have to get information in segments. When I see, when I see the information and it flows, my mind uh, receives it more effectively. I am 96, you know, there's a lot of people who are 96 who lose that intellectual edge for that very reason. They think in short bursts, have little memory losses, and can find difficulty putting the pieces together. Mm -hmm. uh, I can unify it, take a position, as a matter of fact, I've always felt that in the moment before decision, all heads turn to one man. And if you are that man, you better be prepared to do what has to be done. Because that's how life is. I mean, I ran a business for 20 years. I, well, the reason I called ourselves Stratford lithographers with an S was because I was alone and I didn't have partners or areas where I could consult and you get used to a certain position. We started out with three people and it cost $43,000 to go into the printing plant at that time. And to do the same thing today, the same thing, would cost a million four hundred thousand dollars. Now, at that time, a man could work and put together the saving of forty-three thousand dollars. Yeah, because I know that it can be done because I did it. But what guy who starts out, who is zip? So, um, Florence and I were stone broke poor when we got married. Your wife? My wife and I. Uh, we, our first apartment cost $50 a month. And there was a secret to it. I did not want her to know it was a super's apartment in Brooklyn. I'd simply, and somebody would come to the door and say, where's apartment 6A? say, how should I know? And I, 
shut the door. At the end of a year, we put together enough we were going to move to a four-room apartment, a little more life. It was America then, and things got better. And Florence came to me and said, Sonny, said, I, I've got to tell you something. I've kept this a secret from you for a year. She says, this is a super support. Life is strange. <laughs> it's strange. So after um, going back, um, so after you know America declared war on Japan, and they later Hitler declares war on the United States. What was your plan? Did you know that you're going to be called up into the service? Well, or? I was very fortunate in that my uncle Mike Michael Ludgen had been in uh, uh, in, in the army. In uh, for the War of 1898, it's called the Spanish-American War, and uh, uh, when when we found out that we were at war, I went to him and said, "Uncle Mike, what's the advice?" And now he had been working at the Navy Yard for uh, many years. The Brooklyn Navy Yard. The Brooklyn Navy Yard. I think he was already retired then. Uncle Mike lived to be 94. And, no, not, gee, I think it was, I think it was 96. Well, anyways, at that time, he said, you're going to be called up or you're going to enlist now, depending. Uh, he said, so I said, what's the value? And he, he said, no, he said, stay out of it for a while, while you can. He said, you'll get called up. I said, well, what should I do? He said, go to work at, at the Brooklyn. He had been working. She said, go to work at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I said, can I get a job? Yeah. He said, they'll, he said, they'll snap you up. In the Brooklyn Navy Yard, there were three ranks of helper, four ranks of apprentice, three ranks of mechanic, and then supervision. So I came as a third class helper. At the Brooklyn Navy Yard. At the Brooklyn Navy Yard. But just as at school, they had a tendency to sort of push me forward, and get me out all the time. So in the Navy Yard, also I went three, two, one in, in helper very, very quickly. I became a third class mechanic. And then. You're a mechanic, what's the thing to do? Second, and I became, in two years, I was a first class mechanic. And when I became a mechanic instructor, that it took my Uncle Mike 25 years to do. Well, I, I did it in two, but of course, there was one enormous loss because of it. One enormous loss. You see, I was working 11 hours a day and going to school for three hours a night, three days a week. And it was, that's a, that's a killing, uh, uh, frankly, I, I don't know, I don't know how the hell I did it. But you did it. I did it. So, um, I know the, the, the point of the story is, I was going with a girl who had it all. A wealthy family, a beautiful girl, a well-spoken, a kind, a, oh, everything, you can't, and I must, I will confess that she gets better looking every time I tell the tale, but the, uh, 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 we were on the subway together, and in the middle of a sentence of a story she was telling, I fell asleep. She wouldn't talk to me. She wouldn't answer my calls. She would take me home was uh, the last kind words she said to me. And she said to me as, take me home, which was, oh boy, no kiss that night. <laughs> and, uh, so I did lose utterly peppercorn. 
That was her name? Yeah. Uh, so um, when you were at the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, working there, did you, you worked on the ships that were coming in um, as a mechanic? Or what, what, what were you working on in the Navy Yard? I had one function the entire time I was there. And that was, once I became a mechanic instructor, I was placed in charge of armor design for the uh, main deck. And that is a uh, very responsible position. But when General Douglas MacArthur said to the Japanese uh, representative, sign here and that's all he said there were no speeches at the end of the war sign here was all that was said they were walking on my deck and every plate they walked on had had my initials sdk sdk stamped on two sides of that plate the plate was between 24 and 37 feet long uh, uh long it was between seven and nine feet wide. It was one and about one and a half inches of STS, special treatment steel. And that was the, for the USS Missouri? And that was for the USS Missouri, the BB-63. And on two sides of that plate, my initials had been stamped where the rabbits were scarves. The rabbit was scarf. I'm using strange words, okay. When two pieces are to fit and you cut them so that they will fit in a special way, that cut is called either rabbit if it's square or if it's smooth, it's called a scarf. And the rabbit and the scarf and every one of those plates was designed by me, stamped at the outside and with my initials SDK before wow. they would do it. Now remember, now you're talking about 30, you're talking about 27 to 30 feet that's cut yeah. out of a, a, a plate that's worth, what, $30,000? So the plates that you made for the USS Missouri for that deck yeah, was where the Japanese surrendered. Yes. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. Yes, it was. I mean, you talk about war stories. I guess they don't tell that one very often. So... But, uh, I'm, yeah. so, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. You no, no, it was a, it was, so the, the, sh, the ship was launched. I mean, the BB-6, now that was something. Uh, Senator, oh, he became president. Senator Harry S. Truman mm -hmm. came, came down there with his daughter. And they couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't break the bottle of champagne. They, she threw it once. She threw it twice. She threw it times. She threw it four times, and the goddamn thing didn't break. When she threw it the, the fifth time, this, uh, oh, I don't know, I think it was an ensign. I think they, this ensign caught the bottle back, hit it with a hammer, and broke the bottle. I think they made him a, a lieutenant. <laughs> no, no, I, it was considered a, a very, very clever, yeah. effective thing to do. They broke the bottle and the, the ship was so you were also, down the way. So you were there for the launching of the Missouri? Yes. yes. And then I went to see Uncle Mike. And I said, the uh, ship was launched. I'll probably get called up. And I was. I was called up. And he gave me instructions. He said, the first 90 days, you must not, under any circumstances, and whatever is offered, you must not volunteer. I said, you know, I said, that's not reasonable. He said, I won't let you out of this room until you make that promise. So I said, okay, you know, I promise you, I will not volunteer the first 90 days. I'm in the army, okay. He said, uh, and he says, after that, you're on your own. He says, I will advise you. He said, you've got to, in your baptism of fire, 
He says, I don't know when it will come. But he says, in your baptism of fire, he says, you have to be prepared for the remark that you will say. I said, what are you talking about? He says, you're going to be scared. But some of everyone around you be scared because you haven't faced fire before. And the first time you're under fire, be prepared to say something smart or funny or memorable, but be prepared. I said, I hope. You know, God knows. I said, baptism of fire. So I'm in the army and it's the, the second day and they're marching us around and the sergeant comes forward and he said, have any of you men Newspaper experience. And I want you to know, that was the job I was built for. And I'm standing there and I'm saying, because of my freaking uncle, I'm going, my life is going to be ruined because I can't say anything. I gave my promise. I can't. And two guys volunteered. And they said, yes. And he said, will you men pick up the newspapers? If you've got newspaper experience, pick up the newspapers and get the boats. Oh, God. And I thought, Uncle Mike. <laughs> Uncle Mike. And, uh, you know, I said, uh, you know, I hope I give the same good advice to the kids who come to me if I make it through now. So when were you called up into the Army? When were you drafted? You, do you remember? I think it was May of... 1943, I think. And where, and where did you go for your basic training? Um, do you remember? Mc, yes, Fort McClellan, Alabama. And there I met, in my outfit, when I was there, you know, they always move me forward for some reason. I was a Hollywood sergeant. A Hollywood sergeant is a recruit, and you wear a black band on your arm that has three stripes on it, you know. Do you remember? And I had to get out of that. No, I had to get it off. No, but you aren't aware. It's not very, well, I don't know if I should discuss it even. My sister said that there was one function in the war I got in the army. I am to remember it. And she said, uh, I don't, she didn't want me to advance to an effective area in the, in the army. She wanted me to survive. She says, the nature of my interest, she said, and your interest is survival. Now, Uh, she, she, she advised a, a lot of things that are uh, really und undiscussable, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, they were supposed to get you through the war. Yeah. And I didn't, she didn't want me. So I got out of, uh, yeah. when I could. Uh, the Hollywood sergeant. The Hollywood sergeant thing. And, uh, well, a lot of, uh, but I met a guy. I met Walter Gershwini, and Walter Gershwini was like me. Gee, I don't even have to finish that sentence. Walter Gershwini was like me. He was, except in music. He said, uh, we were talking, he said, you know Big Spider Brick? And I said, I don't follow baseball. He said, big spider, big is music. <laughs> he says, he's touching it. And there was a whole series of music, just as he did not know my end. I knew uh, 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 15 operas and 25 symphonies, and he wasn't aware of, of those. But uh, he got me interested. And I said, well, you know, when I was a kid, my father 
it got me interested in songs. And I, I was interested in the lyrics of songs. And he says, well, he said, there's another type of music. He said, and the beat is as important as the language is. And it's, it's Sunday. We had been in the army, I don't know, a couple of weeks, six weeks. They gave us the weekend off. Kashuni and I were the only guys in the library. <laughs> he and I were the only guys. And I, let me tell you, it's a hot, hot place down there. And the library was cool. Well, not a, they hadn't invented air conditioning yet, but it was cool because it was cool. Great place to be. We left it later on, but we didn't want to get drunk and... Yeah. So after you finished your basic training, uh, yeah. where did you go from there after basic training? Do you remember? Yeah. Uh, the Leon wrote 10 days and then shipped off. Overseas? Overseas. To England? Yeah, it was funny. Sylvia Collip, she became my, there's a complicated story. She became my wife's best friend. But when Sylvia was 18 and I was 21, we dated for six months. Now in those days, dating was different. No sex. No, you can't say that. Five sex, five hot kisses. You know, but uh, nothing serious. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hugged while we listened to the music of uh, I'm just a girl who can't say no. I'm in a terrible fix. Uh, Oklahoma. And the funny thing is, I know all the lyrics to Oklahoma, including the girls' parts. <laughs> and everybody says, well, I can understand. You, you know, I hear that you've been to, well, I've been down Kansas City Mall. You should know that. But how can you know? I'm just a girl who can't say no. I'm in a terrible fix. I always say, come on, let's go. Just when I ought to say, nix. <laughs> well, and I could go on to the whole thing. Because I learned all the, the lyrics with Sylvia. And, and that was before you shipped out? Yeah, later on, I mean, 50 years later, when Sylvia and, and Florence became buddies, we never spoke of uh, that particular period. But when I used to help her get out of a car, she'd give my hand a squeeze, you know? <laughs> Say she remembers the old days. Uh, her son became uh, Bloomberg's partner, mm. and they're, uh, he's a billionaire. Uh, it was in the that magazine, uh, that uh, the hundred seventy seventh wealthiest man in America. Mm. I mean, Sylvia, uh, my kids are wonderful and successful in their own little way. I have three children, uh, uh, two girls and a boy. Uh, one daughter is the principal of a uh, high school in the Bronx. Uh, one daughter is sort of of independent means, like my mother, I guess. She's, she graduated as a physician, but she chose to be a teacher, saying that she wanted to uh, be home when her children came home from school. She wanted to fulfill her role as, as mother at the same time she was working. And she became a teacher. Language changes. <laughs> you see, she was fantastic the first few years. And that every one of the, her students who uh, was studying uh, science passed the regents, every one. Now, in those days, you used to say, regardless of ethnicity or economic position, but you don't anymore. Now you say, whether they were black or poor, 
day you have everybody passed. I mean, language got a little simpler and harsh. Yeah. Well, oh, so she became a teacher. My son is a computer expert uh, at uh, this time. And, uh, it's good to be a computer expert right now. I have need of them. He's doing some fantastic work. Uh, they'll be able to, you get into the event or out of it quickly by just uh, looking into the thing. They have your eye uh, thing. It's very complicated, but uh, yeah. they, they, can, they can do some wonderful things now. So going back, um, when you arrived overseas during the war. Oh, um, so from, from the last thing, the last thing I said to Sylvia was that's where we should have spent this weekend. And I was pointing to a hotel just before I got on the subway. And she said, that's right. That's where we should have spent the weekend. That kept me warm <laughs> when I went to Europe. Well, anyway. So when you arrived in England, yes. uh, was that before D-Day or after? It was after, uh, it was after D-Day. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. It must have been more than 14, 15 days. Yeah. Uh, no, I, let me say, uh, but when we landed, now mind you, I had just had a date in New York at that nightclub and then that drive around the park and uh, and then uh, I'm, I'm, uh, and the guy decides and says walk directly in the footsteps of the man in front of you this place is heavily mined uh. and this was in England or when you no that Scotland England and then France. No, then France. Then we 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 landed in France. And then, then the, a, a terrible part of the war for me. Where did you land in France? Was it La Havre, or do you remember where? You yeah, uh, we. Where, where did they took? Oh, oh, Normandy. Normandy. Oh. Yeah, we were on the beaches. And the sergeant, when you landed, said, "Walk, follow the footsteps of the guy." Right, right. Right. This place is heavily mined. Once you. You were 50 yards in. And what unit were you with when you landed in France? I was a, 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 a replacement. I was a replacement. Oh, so you weren't in any unit? I wasn't yeah. in any unit at that time. No. No, first we went to a replacement depot. And I did not know. While we were on our way there, I said, what are those guys? The ones who are fixing the road. He said, they're engineers. I said, the engineers fix the road? I said, well, the other guys are fighting. These guys fix the road? I said, that's a place to be. Now, the difference between engineers and combat engineers is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. I mean, they're, they're so when the, uh, that captain was looking for volunteers for the combat engineers, I said, engineers, he's looking for volunteers? That's crazy, that's a fantastic job. And I went to him and I started to sell him because I had been in the Navy Yard and I had some special talents. And he's going there, you know, <laughs> I got one. Uh, um, so I got in the combat engineers. What unit in the engineers were you with? 425th Combat Engineers, Company B. Uh, it was third platoon, third squad. Wow. Oh, I, I, and the names of, of the names of my leaders were a a Brooklyn a Brooklyn movie cartoon. The name of the captain was uh, uh, written by the Marx Brothers. The name of my captain was John J. Upchurch III. Now, I want you to know, 
he was a West Pointer, and we went through the war. He was uh, a tribute to the school. He was good. Good. He was never. I understand later on he was a drunkard, and, and then later on, well, men have weaknesses. But I'm talking about during the war. He was an honor to West Point. He conducted himself perfectly. My lieutenant, on the other hand, had been a sergeant in the regular army, and he had had a, a seventh grade education. Uh, an Irish guy. Hmm. He was only about five seven, thin as a rail, and he looked like he, he, he you know, he couldn't f get himself out of a paper bag. He was a fighter. But he had a problem. He was going to keep those lieutenant bars if it killed us. And he was the head of the platoon. So when the, the captain would want volunteers, would, uh, I mean, certain of the, certain problems that you had with special and were sort of especially dangerous. When we were called to uh, pick up mines in front of the infantry, uh, when we were on a frontless assault, that was lousy. I mean, we had a lot of trouble then. Or when the Neckar River must be in the shape of an S or something, because I swear I crossed the Neckar three times. So, so when... Yeah. I'm sorry. So, uh, but he would volunteer us to get an enemy soldier, you understand, to capture an enemy soldier. Those were very... Uh, Your lieutenant volunteered you. Always. always. Number one, always. Patrick Reedy was his name. Patrick... Patrick what? Patrick Reedy. R-I-E-D-Y. Wow. Patrick Reedy. Seventh grade education. Thin, small, five foot seven guy. Uh, never drunk, but always drinking. Never drunk, always drinking. <laughs> but never drunk. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the sergeant was Sergeant Cohn. And Sergeant Cohn the ideal man, really the ideal man. He was everything, everything okay. He was opposites. He was tough and gentle. He was harsh and kind. He was <laughs> great sergeant, great sergeant. So when, when you arrived in France, um, and you were assigned to the 425th Combat Engineers, was that? Yeah, 425th Combat Engineers. So, what, do you remember what month that was? In, no, no, but I remember we were assigned to 398th Infantry, part of the 100th Division, oh. under General Patch. Oh, under the 100th, you were under the 100th Infantry Division. Yes. And, um, and you fought through France and into, into yeah. Germany. That's the way it was. I was... Lousy about it. At that time, Brooklyn was the third largest city in the United States. We were Nancy, the third largest city in France. We made our way to the war all the way through to Stuttgart, third largest city in Germany. And I felt the third largest. That's my freaking life. I'm going to die. And they sent us on a uh, R&R, &R. what does that stand for? Rest and Recuperation. Rest and, re and re Rehabilitation. They sent us out Rest and Rehabilitation. And I said, I'm, I said, I'm, I'm going to Paris. So I, I got clever. I went to the uh, first sergeant and I said, look, I got a girl in town and I'm going to shack up with her, I'm telling you now, but I'm going to be back here. For the, when you 
when we gotta go back, you'll see me an hour in advance, I'm gonna be here because I'm a responsible guy. My name is Sheldon Calva. And I'm like, okay. And I'm gonna be here. And I'm telling you that. But I'm telling you also, I'm breaking away. He says, yeah, kid. He says, you wanna go to town? Go to town. So I go to the railroad station and standing there, ready to go to Paris, is a train on its way to Paris. As soon as I said, I'm going to Paris, a guy, I, he's not buddy or anything, this is almost a stranger, says, I'll go with you. And he was, he was just an anchor, you know, around a, 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 a so we, we, we get on the train, it's two o'clock in the morning, we, have, we were lying on the floor asleep, and an MP comes and wakes, wakes us up, and I thought to myself, and uh, he says, listen, the train's stopping, and we're, we're, we're feeding the soldiers, so go, go get your food. Your food. Oh. Okay. And I got to Paris. Now, you see, some people get to Paris as tourists, some as artists. I went as a pack mule. I was carrying stuff to sell. We had liberated some uh, German cigars, and I had K rations and stuff, scarf, an extra scarf. And I went into my French then was very poor college French, very poor college French. But I went into this, uh, where they fix ladies hair, uh, a salon. Well, no, I can't use that word when we speak, because it, it has another meaning in French as well that, we're, that I respect, because Later on, when I was asked to a salon, it was of a completely different meaning. But I, I was a lady's hair place. And I went in the, as a salesman. And they said, well, how much is that? He said, looks to me like, must be very good. Looks like it's worth 50 francs. So she said, how much is that? And I said, 50 francs. <laughs> You know, I'm learning as I, I could go along. And I got enough francs to be independent. And I'm in Paris, and I've got enough money. And I went to, uh, when I said, to, I beg your pardon, sir, I was saying it in French, uh, can you tell me where the Champs Elysees is? He says, are you insulting me? I said, I beg your pardon, sir. He said, this. Is the Champs Elysees? You're on it. Oh, oh, thank you. I woke up in a place there called Rond Point. Now, wait, wait, wait a second. There's a place there now called uh, Charles de Gaulle Center. At that time, it was called Star Etoile. And uh, I see Ed Ames, and he's pulling guard duty. I said, Ed, you're a sergeant. What the hell are you doing? Working in front. He says, this is Shave Head Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Forces. He says, this is Shave Headquarters. He says, I'm a sergeant, I'm nothing. He says, you don't know how low the rank is. He says, what are you doing here? I said, Ed, I'm a war. But I had to see Paris. I had to get here. He says, uh, I said, where do they chow up? He says, it's Point to a street two blocks down. He says, but you need a card in case they stop you. I, he said, uh, and he said, I'll get you the cards, but I won't sign it. I said, I'll sign it. So I had to sign two cards for this guy I'm with too. I said, what's a good name? Sergeant Lowenstein. I know, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Lowenstein. I signed, that's right. Signed it. And we, turned, well, we both got cards, and we can walk down. They didn't check the cards. 
You were wearing a, a uniform. You went and you got chow. I mean, so while we're having chow, a guy said, uh, uh, I got a car. He said, and I got the, I moved the general around. But he gave me, I got three days off now. I said, you got a, a car? And you're free three days? I said, I can't drive. He says, yeah. I said, my friend will sit with you in front. So he sat up front, and I'm in the general seat. <laughs> and we saw Paris. We drove in the general's car. In the general's car. It's open, you know. And we saw it. They drove around to the interesting spots. And then, well, we came back to uh, Grand Point, and there's a two blocks down, street, streets with a P. Oh, I wish I could remember. And it's a very bad section of town. Plus Pigalle? Yeah. Well, no, Plus Pigalle. <laughs> a different place. No, 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 no. Piquet, no. It was one of uh, uh, one of uh, Napoleon's victories. Mm. So, uh, well, anyways, I'm up the block, and I don't know if this is a proper thing to tell. And I didn't do anything improper myself, but we went into. Uh, I was looking for accommodations for the night, and there was. This oh, who was there, uh, and uh, the woman is doing the books, and while she's doing the books, in the second column, I said, "Your second column is incorrect." I'm saying in French, so I thought maybe I didn't say it right. She said, "You're looking over my shoulder." She said, "I have five columns of numbers here. You tell me that the second column is incorrect." I said, "Yeah." She said, are you, are you a bookkeeper? I said, well, I do books. So uh, she said, uh, I said, well, we're, we're looking for a room for tonight. She says, really? She says, uh, check these other numbers. She says, are they correct? And I look, one, two, three, four, five. Um, I said, they're all correct, except number two is wrong. Text number two, and it's wrong. And she texts the other, and they're right. So she says, uh, "Have a seat," and she gives me a bunch of and it's numbers, baby stuff. So I said, "Yes, yes, 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 yes." No, no, no. And, and if there were, if there's anything wrong, it's so obvious that okay. Then you wonder how is they able. To to give a, an answer. And the thing was, I see that there are eight numbers down, and they're all uh, even numbers, two, four, six, eight. And that the answer at the bottom is one, which is an uneven number. Well, that can't happen. I mean, you look at it and you say, it's wrong. You, you, you don't have to be genius. And uh, so I did the books for Madam, and we got a night's sleep. <laughs> and in the morning, when I got up, I was doing exercises, and across the road, there was this girl. I think that there was a... And she said, and I said, and she said, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Paris was where I had to be. Had to be in Paris. And how long were you in Paris for? Uh, three days. And then when you got back to your unit, who, 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 in time, in, in time, time uh, just in time, sort of. I sort of caught one of the last buses. And how? It, it left me with a a memory of Paris. You understand? I luck I had gotten transfer. When we went to that first hotel and we saw B-Day and we said, 
what is it? You know, my buddy and I saw this B day, and you say, how do you, you know, how do you, how do you use it? Where does it flush? <laughs> and the maid, <laughs> the maid got over it to show it. Okay, the Paris was an excitement, and uh, I made Paris was where I wanted to be. Yeah, I went back into the service, and. Uh, and thank God for the next. We had a wonderful air corps uh, in the in the last push from uh, almost the French border, almost the start of France to almost the beginning of Germany. During that whole cruise, instead of moving uh, a mile a day, or two miles a day, or five miles, we moved twenty miles. Day. We, when we got there, the Air Force, the Air Force had chewed them up. The Germans. The Germans chewed them up. We could move. Jesus, if they hadn't, if they hadn't, we would have. It was. It would have been very slow going. But then, when I saw that field. What field? Well, around Louis Louis I think it was big field and all those dead guys. Germans? No. Americans? Yeah, waiting to be. Oh, so they were casualties. Oh yeah, and you felt. And they were waiting to be buried, or were they? I, frankly, I don't know. We just passed them, and I was. Unhappy for two days. Did you did you see action when you were with the with the engineers? You saw a lot of action. <laughs> yes, it, indeed. From France yeah. all the way through Germany. Yeah, you you gotta understand. We had elementary plumbing facilities because of all the action. We saw a shovel and and a hump of dirt. Yeah. I mean, Jesus. The. So you're. They were cake. They kept moving and moving and moving, moving. So what was the most common thing that you did? Was it clear minefields for the infantry behind, or was it, what was? It was pretty close to everything. Everything. We crossed border. We, we, there was one point in the Battle of the Bulge. We were in the south. Battle of the Bulge was in the north. In the north, 15,000. American soldiers were taken prisoner by the German. 17,000 soldiers were killed. It was a tough battle. In the south, France is shaped at one point going with a deep arrow into Germany. Mm -hmm. At the end of that deep arrow is a town called Enzenberg. Some general n understood that as soon as they kept a little farther forward on the, uh, in the Battle of the Bulge, they were going to straighten their lines. And that we needed, so they had to send two soldiers into Enzenberg to get killed. Because their function was to set up a minefield. And when the Germans start the preparation, they would be informed and they would set up the mines, and that would stop the Germans, for, I don't know, an hour and a half, enough maybe for the aircraft to get to do some damage. So General had a great idea, but yeah. I was one of the two guys that they put in Enzenberg, and they knew that we had had it. It was over for us. It, and we knew it was over. They gave the two of us 10 and 1 rations. I don't know if you know what that means, but you've been around the army long enough to, we, instead of getting two candy bars, we got 10. Instead of bacon for two guys, we got bacon 
with Ted. The two of you? The two of us. They knew it was over for us. They gave us 10 one rations because as soon as the Germans straightened their lines. So they sent you and one other guy. What was the other guy's name? Do you remember? So they sent the two of you into Ensenburg by yourselves yes. to, to plant. Oh, and so, well, we had the pattern. Mm -hmm. So we set up the pattern of uh, the minefields. There were, there were no APs, uh, no anti-personnel mines, just anti-tank mines. And we, uh, we had the pattern. And it was easy to set up a pattern because we could cover it with snow. And we, we set up our pattern so that we could uh, get the mines in place. The question of minutes and, and, a, and, a, uh, and minutes mm -hmm. when, the, uh, when the action started. So we would set, I mean, we had our function ready and we were prepared for what had to be done. And when they came and they took us back, You were happy <laughs> to get out of there. Do you remember any other um, combat uh, instances? Uh, yeah, but no on it to me. There was this German guy who was in the middle. It was, it was winter. He was caught on the, on this uh, uh, barbed wire. And I said, he's a puma being. I can't do this. I'm cutting him down. And they said to me, he said, the Germans are putting APs on their, the Germans are putting anti-personnel mines on these guys that blow up the engineers when they cut them down. You want your parents, that's what you want? You want your parents to get that because you fucking killed yourself for nothing? And, oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, Sorry. Uh, I didn't. In the German, he was. And I didn't. I didn't. To this day, that guy is still hanging on that goddamn barbed wire. And he was a German soldier who was. He was dead. He, he was dead. He'd been dead two days. But they. But I didn't. I should have cut him down. But then, you know, you get. You're in the middle of it and you get talked out of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I was wrong not to. And, uh,. Did you ever um, have any experiences with German prisoners that were being taken? Yeah. Uh, well, I watched Sergeant Cohen, who was a master at everything he did. I mean, cripes. From my point of view, he could have been a general. He was a, a fantastic sergeant. And he asked his uh, lieutenant some minor question. Uh, where or how many or when, I don't know. And he could speak uh, uh, German because he spoke Jewish, which is uh, 15th century German, I understand. And uh, he, uh, 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 the German officer was haughty for only a minute and then said, I don't know, t the answer was 2,000 or some number, you know. How many Germans there were? Oh, yeah. I don't know. You know, to me, it was something happening over there. I'm too goddamn tired to listen in. So the sergeant was interrogating a German officer. Yeah, he put... Well, I think well, it's no harm to say it now. He asked the German, uh, and the German said something like, from the floor, <laughs> he, he gave that guy. I mean, Jesus. The sergeant punched. But he, he, yeah, but masterfully. I mean, perfectly, like he did every goddamn thing else. So the sergeant Cohen was a, uh, was a, you know why I got the sergeant Cohen? Because I'm lucky. So that German officer must have said something that <laughs> ticked him off. No, it, it starts earlier. We took 
over this house in a small town. Well, I can't say small town. Well, big town. Big town, I think. In Germany? In Germany. And we uh, were... Uh, I was on the second floor with this other guy. And I... Uh, and we were, t we were just talking. And we were shelled. Now, I don't know what the hell they were. I think they called them Nubble Versus. Nubble Versus. Yeah, Nubble Versus, yeah. Yeah. And uh, one, one landed, and I'm blown seven feet. And I land in the bed. Soft. In the bed. Talk about luck. Talk about luck. If something had been, uh, I, it would have killed me. Uh, if if you talk about luck, I landed in the freaking bed. Jim, I, I wait a second. I go downstairs, and there is. I went to the first squad then, and there's the uh, the sergeant. He, I said, tell everybody to get to the truck. We gotta get out of here. Now the the truck is full of TNT. But the only way that uh, TNT will explode is if it, there's a charge that sets it off. Otherwise, I want you to know you could burn it and, and, and nothing go. Get to the truck. Get to the truck. Get out of here. And he said, uh, So I said, Get to the truck. And I said, I mean, just the very time that you need a sergeant, the very time he turns to. He, he, uh... He, yeah, he was uh, not uh, very useful. Was that... So I, I, I had to get out of that first squad. That was a different... That wasn't Sergeant Cohen, though. Oh, was... believe me. Cause, uh, now, Sergeant Cohen had a bunch of misfits there. They're big, they're small. They're, uh... Now, the first squad were gorgeous. I mean, we were all... We were all six feet, uh, uh, well-spoken, uh, good-looking guys. Mm -hmm. First squad was one you could be proud of. The third squad was a terrible squad. We were all misfits. But I said, I got to get out of the first squad. What happened to that sergeant who... Um, no, I think he's, he got, made it through the war to the end. He wasn't removed from his position or anything? But you guys... I never, I never, I, I don't want to, yeah. I wouldn't put another guy in trouble. But you, you all got managed to get out of the house and in the truck and... Well, kinda, yeah, uh, we, we, we moved on. God. Wow. And selling is scary. But Uncle Mike had told me the first time that I should be prepared that I was. It was the smartest line In Shakespeare, there's a certain phrase of all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts, his act being seven scenes. At first the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, then the schoolboy with shiny morning face and satchel under arm crawling like snail unwillingly to school. Then the lover, full of oaths to his mistress's eyebrow butt. And then the soldier, seeking the bubble, reputation, even in the cannon's mouth. And it's that particular phrase. And then the soldier, seeking the bubble, even in the cannon's mouth, that Uncle Mike had prepared me for. You have, remember and we're all, we're, we're all, we're all replacements. That is where nobody in the army, that's like your dirt. You, you, you were infantry replacements. That is the lowest form of earth in the, in the army. And we come under shelling. And I said, this is it. Absolutely prepared. And I said, first, I don't want to get killed. I don't want to get hurt. But if I make it through, this is the line. And I said, look, the pay is lousy, and the hours stink. I said, but it is war work. And everybody thought that was so funny, because in 
civilian life. You would take, instead of getting $42 a week, you'd get $28 a week, but it is war work, you know, so at least you're doing something noble while you're losing the money. But everybody is familiar with that line. The other guys thought I was the wittiest guy since, since uh, uh, Haywood Brown. And this was while you were being shelled. <laughs> and I was just as scared as they were. And yet, it was experience that had saved my life. It's one month before the end of the war. And um, I, I left. I don't know why, but I left. I left the line, and I'm walking. This is about a mile and a half to cover and concealment to a, a place behind the lines. Mm -hmm. But I'm exposed, and I hear. And I knew enough when the shell would land because it goes whoop, and before it says whoop, uh, you have that five seconds. So when I have the five seconds, there's an enfilade alongside the road, and I I jump into it, and thank God it was dry because normally water runs runs through this, but this was May. It was a warm month, and I'm there, and it goes, as I'm there, right after I'm there, it goes, va -oop. and then as soon as it went, va -oop, I got out, and I ran another, because so that they'd have to readjust the aim, and it was, what the hell are they, I couldn't believe it, they were shooting an 88 at one soldier, it's like spending 300 bucks a shot, and during the war, I mean, people don't know, but, 50,000 rounds was spent for every soldier that was wounded or killed. 50,000 rounds for every... So, uh, they must have had 16-year-olds, uh, uh, the Germans, this is near the end of the war. You know, God knows. So the Germans were singling you out on the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I, run, I run ahead, and then I hear again, and it comes in, and I was about to raise my tushy up when there was another boom. You see, because I heard, because I heard, and because I was an experienced soldier, because I'd been under shelling long enough to learn. What was terrible was the new guys they sent up who got killed right away. That was such a, such a mess. I should have cut that chain down and never did. Well, Anyways, the war was the war. It's only a portion of, of the time. Do you remember um, entering into Germany? Did you ever come across any of the uh, concentration camps or the... Uh, yeah. Did you ever come yeah, across yes. any of those? I came across. It was only a, like a work area, but it was a work area like... I mean, you can't even call it that. It was terrible. It was just, just plain, plain, plain terrible. And they loved us. And it used to be that the coal detail was terrible. I mean, a very bad. Deal. And did you, the Jews that you liberated? I know. No, were? no. I we never we never. We never went to a, I never got to a camp. Yeah. We were, but it was a we work were, area. Uh, this, only this work area. But there, we really helped guys at the lowest level. But I must confess, I really took a little advantage, too. Because when they gave us the call detail, those guys volunteered. And I took them, and they really did the work. And I was just super. And uh, it's a lousy job. Do you remember yeah. going further into Germany up to VE no, Day? No, I only went, we only went to Fellback. Fellback is to Stuttgart, as Brooklyn is to New York, as Brooklyn is to Manhattan. 
Oh, how about it's a little a suburb. And the thing that I remember about it is the most beautiful tree I ever saw. And then there was, of course, this girl, German girl. I don't know. I always seem to be able to speak enough of everything to get understood. And before that, I met this, uh, we were in Göppingen. Yes, we were in Göppingen. And I was assigned to this uh, German uh, factory, I guess. And I could converse with the guy in French. He spoke French, and I spoke French. And he was a German, I was an American, but we used French as our lingua franca. Oh, and I suppose that is correctly said as a lingua franca. And uh, he taught me some German songs. There was one very popular then. Uh, for der Kaserne, for dem großen Tor, stand eine Laterne und steht sie nach davor. Da und wir uns wiedersehen, bei der Laterne wollen wir stehen. Lily Marlene. Bin mit dir, Lily Marlene. Marlena Dietrich made that famous, I think she did. You know the name? Yes. That's wonderful. I had a date with Marlene Dietrich after the war. And I, I hesitate to refer to it now, thinking that nobody would know the name Marlene Dietrich. How did you get the date with Marlene Dietrich? I graduated from the Sorbonne and I got a job with the State Department, the Office of the Foreign Liquidation Commissioner. We were attached to the embassy in Paris. And uh, I was outside the exchange and uh, she showed up. Now I had never seen her, but you know, in the interest of romance. So I went to her, she was wearing this gorgeous mink coat. And I said, Marlene, I saw you sing, and you were just playing wonderful. I want you to know our hearts were touched by you. And she said, oh, tell me, what are you doing now? I said, I'm with the office. Well, I'm from the Kodesh Commission. She said, you selling any Jeeps? I said, yes, we have them in three categories. I said, they're uh, 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 excellent, is $600, good is $400, and poor is $200. She said, can you get an excellent one at a poor price? I said, I'm sure something can be worked out. And that lad, she's a movie star, right? Come on. So I'll get her there. She said, I'll see you, uh, I'll see you at two o'clock. So I go back to the office and I said to the uh, guard, listen, you know, uh, Marlene Dietrich is coming, going to be asking, for me in about an hour at two o'clock or so. I said, I'm going to be in my office. Make sure to call me. Make sure that I'm there. And I I want to, you know, we're offering up the services of our department. So it's 2.15. And I had been there and I changed my tie. I straightened my shirt. And I combed my hair. And I, okay. I, I was gorgeous. I was absolutely good. I came out and I said, she stood me up. He said, what are you talking about? I said, Marlene Deep is supposed to be here at two o'clock. Oh, he said, she came. I said, you didn't call me. He said, I didn't get a chance. The Major General, his son. Now, you understand, I was a uh, T5 during the war. And he said, Major General, his son uh, took care of her personally. Now, her reputation with uh, generals during the war was uh, of a particular nature and uh, she was supposed to have made them all. Uh, 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 so I was very, 
philosophic very quickly. My date with uh, Arlene Dukas just never <laughs> turned out as well as I wanted to. <laughs> but uh, oh, incidentally, it's so hard for a 96-year-old guy to say, but she was 50. She looked so old. And she had uh, white hair from a portion. She hadn't gotten a good hair job in one place. And yeah. And even the the uh, fur uh, was only so so. I had worked in a fur factory one summer when I was at school. Uh, mm. <laughs> but it was Marlena Dietrich. Marlene Dietrich. Yeah. Do you remember VE Day when uh, victory was declared over Germany when you were in Europe? Yeah. The day Germany surrendered. Because. We were still in the army, and there was not much that we could do, you know. Now, when you're in the army, they don't know if you much alternatives. Fun for a lot of the guys. I mean, even I might say most of the guys was getting drunk. That we, on VE day. On any. On any, any day. day. It, that repelled me. The idea of losing control of your mind. When my father had, I mean, the mind is, no, oh, since I was a, a little kid, you know, your mind is special. You mustn't damage it. So uh, anyways, no, it was a quiet, a quiet day. And you were in Stuttgart or in that village town just outside of Fellback. Fellback. You yes. were just you were in Fellback. I was in Fellback. Oh, so we went and we yeah, but I didn't have a drink. <laughs> That's true. I had a glass of beer and I sat near that beautiful tree. That's all I did. I had, and I kept saying, you know, in America, I'm so used to coffee and cake. I'm so used to. Beer in Frankfurters. I'm so used to food with the drink. I said, here in Germany, they're drinking beer. I mean, that's just, just me. Years later, I saw a statistic, and it said that the Germans are getting fatter and fatter and fatter, and it is not because they eat anymore. It's just they all drink twice as much beer mm -hmm. with their food as uh, we do. That's a that's an interesting story that you sat under that beautiful tree drinking <laughs> beer yeah. at the end of the war. At the end of the war. That's, that's a beautiful uh, memory right there. Well, that was a beautiful tree. This neighborhood, I want you to look around, and we have the most beautiful trees in the world. Sixty years ago, it was thought that the uh, the Dawn Redwood was uh, no longer a species in the world, that it, it, they knew it only in, as stone on one of the deserts. And at that time, they found a forest of Dawn Redwoods in China, and they sent 20 sticks to California. And California sent one of the sticks here, and it's right outside the door. <laughs> it's a Dawn Redwood. Right now it's a little taller than all the trees around, but one day it will be the tallest tree on Long Island. And it's right outside my door. <laughs> and what do they call when it turns to stone? Uh, Fossilization? Yeah, but no. There's, there's a word. Uh, well, shall when we... I was interviewed for the State Department, for 45 minutes, 
I was at the top of my game. I never was as good as that ever again. And I just don't hope to be now that I'm old. But for 45 minutes, she asked me a complex question. It involved It's not really discussed. Top secret, secret, confidential, and restricted material, and the handling in a particular way. And Jesus, I said, well, I'd alphabetize to get this done. I'd, I'd demeritize it in this fashion. We could store it in this thing. I would get uh, 31 copies made so that we could keep it on a monthly basis. That would only be an inch. We could store it at the, the and one year would represent no more than seven inches high of the material we could store there for the I mean whoosh. You got right you blew right through it. I blew it up. <laughs> and the captain said, Report tomorrow. And you know how they rewarded me? Everybody else worked five days a week and I had to work six days. <laughs> at you know, because at I the was, State Department. Yeah, because I was uh, I had and that, and that was after the war. I don't have a word to say against them. In two years, they made me the head of my department. I had guys who were 60 years old working for me. I don't have a word to say against them. And that was at the State Department? Uh, yes. After the war? It's true that they worked you like a slave in the beginning, but uh, it was because they needed to, and they did the right thing. And were I in charge of that? I would have, yes, that kid had to work six days, even if that kid was me. Yes. And how long, but, were you, how long were you with the State Department for? Uh, two years. After the war? Yes. It was... Now you have to understand... Uh, I was a little incorrect. I did not do anything illegal. I didn't do anything... immoral. But I did something a little incorrect. You're not supposed to really uh, get a, a second income when you're working for the government. You're not to, but I had set up something with some cigarettes that uh, brought me francs. My attitude towards francs was very special. <laughs> when I was a kid at Coney Island, I used to play skee ball. I was very good at it. You know, there were three, and I would always hit the top score and get three instead of one. But when you had all those tickets, you would take them over to a counter. And how many tickets to get this? You needed seven tickets to that, you needed 41, and so forth. And you keep playing until you had the tickets. So you felt it was not really money, but it gets you things. That's how I felt about Franks. <laughs> it's not really money. But it gets you things. And so, remember, I'm six feet one and a half. I, I'm three and a half inches shorter than that, that now. Six feet three and a half. And I was, I'm 5'10 now. And uh, I weighed 168 pounds. I weigh uh, 230 now. But then, uh, there were pictures of me. When I saw them after uh, 50 years, I, I couldn't believe it. It looks like, I mean, uh, a movie star. <laughs> I, I mean, God knows. And then, je croyais que toutes les femmes à Paris étaient pesables. I mean, I, uh, you, you get an idea that oh, women are sort of easy. And yet the thing that I had most was something, because it took me 10 years to analyze it before I came to the answer. I thought, did I have a, an aftershave lotion or something? Was it maybe I wore a Hamburg hat? You know, maybe, uh, I wonder, was it the clothes, or was it, uh, what, what was it that, because in, in Paris, 
pardon me, but I was irresistible. And I, and it finally came to me after I was at home for a while. It was what my sister had said. I'm 12 years old. And my sister said, you're plain. She said, get used to it. Nothing terrible. You're plain. But when you're older, things will change really seriously. So I thought, Jesus, when I'm 50 years old, it won't matter anymore. But she didn't mean when I was 50. She meant when I was older, when I was 19 or 20. But I heard it when I'm 12, you know. And so they sort of whizzed me through school. So I'm 15, I'm going out with the 18 year old guys. And when that girl said, you gotta bring somebody along who can take care of himself. Meaning, she was talking about me, you know? And I was socially out of my depth all through school, all through school. I was, I mean, girls were a, a golden goal impossible to attain. So when I got to Paris, and I was a virgin, and I got cured, and cured, and cured, and cured, and cured, and cured. And during those three days in Paris. Yes, and not only that, French girls came with a blueprint. Chelton, il ne s'agit pas de frottage, mais la main ici, doucement. Honey, it's not a question of rubbing, put your hand over here, do small, it, it translates as sweetly, but it really means gently, uh, uh, nicely. Mm. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yes, yes. Well, Sheldon, um... Oh, it's time to go, huh? No, 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 no. Um, I just wanted to say, um, do you have any uh, remarks that you want to say? Because we pretty much covered your entire life. Um, I guess. I guess. Do you have anything that you wish to say um, closing out? Um, do you have anything that you wish to say for people who are going to watch this? Yes. Now, I know there were soldiers who joined veterans groups and made that portion of their life influence their entire life. And in a sense, because I was angry with the world for putting me in a position where I could have been killed so readily and so casually. And because, you see, I had sent Sylvia a Dear John letter only, I wonder you called it, a Dear Joan letter? I have no idea. And decided to take my discharge in Europe and go to Paris and go to the Sorbonne because I changed my life completely. I can understand the army changing your life, but not by being a member of the veterans group and going over the old things. It's only a portion of your life. I've, my wife and I had a wonderful, if, if you mention a city in Europe, London, Paris, Rome, Madrid, Barcelona, the cities of Spain, any one of them, if you had said one of them to my wife, she would have said, lovely, her very name. The day we got to Florence, to Florence, we lived in a room that was six feet from the Arno River, six feet from the Arno River. And that day, they were having the spring fair when we got to Flora. Yes. And our big town, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco. Oh, a wonderful country. Each year, to my year, when they have me out for Thanksgiving, it's the only time, really, I see the family, that one day a year. My daughter 
Lisa has one fantastic room in her 